Now broadcasting from beautiful downtown Tallahassee, it's Classic Movie Reviews with Snark. Welcome to today's show. My name is John. As always, you can subscribe to the show on iTunes or follow the links to social media in the podcast show notes. You can also go to snarkymoviereviews.com to read notes, bios, and other random movie thoughts. I think it was William Faulkner speaking of As I Lay Dying that said, you set up a task for people to do and put obstacles in their way. I'm going to embark on a series of films where the people are trying to go somewhere or get something done and there are obstacles in their way. The first of these movies is The Train, 1964, where a group of Nazis are trying to move a train of stolen art from Paris and are opposed by the French resistance. This movie was ranked number one in Train Magazine's special issue, The 100 Greatest Train Movies. Before I go any further, I wanted to let you know that I will be murdering the French language from here on out. Sorry about that. If you write me an email complaining, I will read it with a fake Nazi accent. Burt Lancaster played the role of La Biche, train station manager and member of the French Resistance. He was covered in episode 30, Birdman of Alcatraz, 1962. Paul Schofield played the role of Nazi and French art thief Colonel von Waldheim. Schofield was born in England in 1922. He began training for the theater in 1939 at the age of 17. When World War II broke out, he was ruled to be physically unfit for military service. He entertained troops during the war. By 1946, he was on his way to becoming a great Shakespearean actor. Schofield was only in about 30 movies, but his talent just leaps off the screen. His first role, for which he received great praise, was That Lady, 1955, where he played King Philip II of Spain with Olivia de Havilland. Of course, Schofield of course, Schofield was so convincing in the train, 1964, as Nazi Colonel von Waldheim that he could pass for a German. In A Man for All Seasons, 1966, as Sir Thomas More, Schofield showed his range from pride to fear, humility, and redemption. During this role, he is taken from counselor to the king, outcast, heretic, convict, and condemned. However, his poise always shows through. It is my opinion that this is his greatest role. Schofield was great in Scorpio, 1973, paired again with Burt Lancaster in a spy thriller. Schofield paired with younger Shakespearean actor Kenneth Branagh in the wonderful Henry V, 1989, in a small part as Charles VI of France. He played the ghost in Hamlet, 1990, along with substandard actor Mel Gibson. In Quiz Show, 1994, Schofield played the role of Mark Van Doren, the academic and father of the man caught at the heart of the Quiz Show 21 scandal. He then turned in a masterful performance as Judge Thomas Danforth during the Salem Witch Trials in The Crucible, 1996. Of course, this story is an anti-McCarthy tale. A private man, he accepted a commander of the Order of the British Empire, CBE, but he refused knighthood three times. He died in 2008 at the age of 86. Janine Moreau played the role of Christine, a hotel proprietor that helped the resistance. Moreau was born in Paris in 1928. She began in the theater in 1947 and began taking movie roles in 1949. Moreau is one of the most popular actresses in France. She has worked with all of the major international directors. The great Roger Ebert thought she was one of the greatest actresses of her generation. I found this quote from imdb.com to be very accurate. Quote, this lack of artifice revealed Moreau's essential qualities. She could be almost ugly, and then ten seconds later she would turn her face and would be incredibly attractive. But she would be herself. Unquote. She is still active and has turned to directing. Susan Flan played the role of Mademoiselle Villard. Mademoiselle Villard inventoried the art at the Nazi distribution point. This character and the Claire Simone, Kate Blanchett character in The Monuments Men 2014 are based on the life of Rose Antonia Marie Valland. Valland was born in France in 1898. She graduated from a teacher's college in 1918 and planned on being an art teacher. She continued her graduate level education until 1932 where she became a volunteer assistant curator at the Jeu Museum. In 1941, following the Nazi occupation of Paris, she was paid and placed in charge of the museum. The Nazis began to loot the treasures of occupied Europe. 
a museum where Valan worked was selected as a distribution point for these works of art. Valan never let the Nazis know she spoke German as she secretly recorded the stolen artwork and its destination. She recorded over 20,000 pieces of art. Valan regularly informed the director of the National Museum of the status of the theft and let the French resistance know which trains were carrying art so they would not be destroyed. On August 1, 1944, almost three weeks before the liberation of Paris, Valan found out that five boxcars of modern art were being shipped out by the Nazis. She notified the French resistance, and they kept the train from leaving Paris. Later, the train was recovered by the French army. Following the war, Rose Valan worked for the Commission for the Recovery of Works of Art and was made the chair in 1954. She wrote her memoirs in 1961 and retired in 1968. For her work, Rose Valan became one of the most decorated women in French history, and she was awarded the Légion d'Honneur, the Medal de la Résistance, the Officer's Cross of the Order of Merit of the Federal Republic of Germany, and the Medal of Freedom from the United States. Rose Valan died in 1980 at the age of 81. Now back to the actress that played the short but important part, Suzanne Flan. Flan slowly became active in the theater and had her first television role in Captain Blomet in 1947. This led to an almost five-decade career that included such films as Moulin Rouge 1952, Confidential Report 1955, The Trial 1962, Thou Shalt Not Kill 1961, The Train 1964, and One Deadly Summer 1983. Flan remained active on stage, in film, and on television until her death at 87 in 2005. Michael Simon played the role of French train engineer Papa Boule. He had a large face and nose, and his face was partially paralyzed in the 50s in a makeup accident. This and his age really gave him a devil-may-care look in this role. Simon was the son of a sausage maker. He was drafted into the Swiss Army at the beginning of World War I. He was discharged because of tuberculosis and a general bad attitude. He worked as a handyman, a boxer, a photographer, and a right-wing anarchist. At last, he became a stage actor and moved to Paris in 1923. His first film was in 1925. With the coming of sound films, Simone became one of the best-known character actors in France. Simone slowed his work after the makeup accident in the 1950s, but he continued to work until his death in 1975. Wolfgang Press played a subordinate German officer, Major Herren, who was the conscience of German Colonel von Waldheim. Press was born in Nuremberg, Germany in 1910. He studied philosophy, dance, and theater science. He had his first stage role in 1932, which it would seem to me to put him on a collision course with the Nazis. However, it did not seem to be so. He was exempt from military service and made his first film in 1942. Following the war, he worked in German films until he was noticed by the international community. In an odd irony, he, like many other German actors of his age band, were continually cast in films as German-slash-Nazi officers. Some of his films include The Longest Day, 1962, The Counterfeit Traitor, 1962, The Cardinal, 1963, The Train, 1964, Von Ryan's Express, 1965, Is Paris Burning, 1966, Anzio, 1968, Raid on Rommel, 1971, and A Bridge Too Far, 1977. He was also in two American miniseries, The Winds of War and War in Remembrance, in the 1980s. He stopped acting in the late 1990s and died at the age of 92 following a fall. Nick Dimitri from episode 17, Hard Times, 1975, played a German soldier, but it was uncredited. Story. This movie begins in August 1944. The Nazis have occupied Paris for over 1,100 days. Nazi Colonel Franz von Waldheim, Paul Schofield, is in the Jet du Pont Museum admiring the paintings of the modern masters such as Picasso, Gauguin, and Renoir. Museum curator Mademoiselle Valan, Susan Flan, turns on the light and admires the works with the Nazi. After a bit of banter, she thanks him for saving the paintings. He asks her if she feels comfortable saying thank you now that the Allies are days away from liberating Paris. He then announces that the paintings are being removed and sent to Germany. Do you like it? Need you ask? I was terrified that these would be lost. 
You won't convince me that you're cynical. I know what these paintings mean to you. You're a perceptive woman. We're removing the paintings. His Nazi henchmen go to work creating the art, and von Waldheim orders the art to be at the train depot in the morning. In the morning, when von Waldheim arrives at the depot, the crates are not loaded and there is no train waiting. He goes to see the French railroad manager, Paul Labiche, Bert Lancaster. Labiche curtly explains that he did not cancel the train, the German army did. How soon can my train be cleared to leave? As soon as I get another order. It's your army, Colonel, not mine. All priority was being given to an armament train. Von Waldheim goes to the headquarters of General von Lubitz, Richard Munch. There is almost a sense of panic as the soldiers pack, burn papers, and rush about with orders. Von Lubitz is only concerned with the evacuation of the German army before they are cut off. Von Lubitz thinks the art that von Waldheim is trying to ship is degenerate, like jazz and all the other stuff Nazis don't like. Von Waldheim makes the case that the art is worth enough to equip ten panzer divisions. Von Lubitz authorizes the train, but with the proviso that if the military needs change, the authorization will be rescinded. Labiche walks across the Nazi-filled rail yard to a river barge that is docked nearby. In the barge are Spinet, Paul Boniface, the area leader of the French resistance, the remaining two members of Labiche's unit, Denont, Albert Remy, and Pesquat, Charles Melat, and Mademoiselle Villard. Spinet explains about the art train. Labiche says he will not waste lives for the art and has already lost 15 men. He says he can blow it up. After some back and forth, Mademoiselle Villain thanks them for the work they are doing and accepts their decision. Didant and Pasqua are much more sympathetic and want to help. Spinet explains that they want the armament train delayed in the rail yard at Ver so it will be caught in the planned 10 a.m. Allied air raid. Labiche believes he can make the delay happen. Pesquad is assigned to the armament train. Because there is a shortage of engineers, Labiche assigns his elderly mentor, Papa Bull, Michael Simon, to drive the art train. Don't you slap the oil on anywhere, damn it! Look for the hell, you freak! This machine was running before you were born. He's like a woman. If you don't treat her just the right way, she'll make your life miserable. Take this. Do it right, for God's sake. Because I'll be back to check after I've had my coffee. Now remember, a grief job is not a bad. Bull is sitting in the rail yard cafe stating his disappointment at not being given a more important job. When he is told that he is taking modern art, he thinks lovingly of a girl he once knew that modeled for Renoir. Have you read what's in those crates? I don't believe anything they write. <laughs> Painted. Open a case. You'll find champagne, perfume, and everything else they stole from us. I've talked to one of the truck drivers. These are paintings. So what? Great art. Picasso, Gauguin, Renoir. Renoir. I used to know a girl who modeled for Renoir. She smelled of pink. Muttering about the glory of France, Bull asked for change in frank coins. In the morning, the armament train driven by Pesquat leaves the yard. Von Waldheim gets a call from von Lubitz rescinding his authorization. Von Waldheim says the train has already left. After the lie, he orders the train to leave immediately. In Ver, Pasquier steams a group of German soldiers and causes a slight delay. Labiche is in the switching tower under the supervision of a German officer. They have to switch to an armored engine for the armament train which will require Labiche to throw several switches. At the critical moment, one of the switches won't move. They have placed the German officer's smoking pipe under the switch so they can't be blamed. German Major Herren, Wolfgang Priest, calls the switching yard about the delay, but it's too late. The air raid begins with the armament train sitting in the yard. The armament train is destroyed. Papa Bull, seeing the air raid, takes the art train through the yard at full speed. Labiche, with Lancaster doing his own stunts, slides down the ladder from the switching station, jumps on the moving train, and is kicked to the ground by Papa Bull. The air raid was filmed at Garganville Yard. More than 50 people worked for six weeks setting the charges that all blew in under one minute. This was allowed because the French National Railway 
wanted to modernize the yard but lacked funding until the film was made. At Reeve Wren, the main rod bearings on Bull's train are smoking. Bull opens the oil valve and removes the franks he used to block the oil flow. He must take the engine back to Ver. German Major Heron finds the oiled and dented franks in Bull's pockets. Labiche pleads for Bull's life and promises to repair the train personally. Labiche almost has von Waldheim convinced when Bull speaks up and calls Labiche a traitor. So it's Oscar. It's a no-trigger around here. They sweep in frank pieces and cut off the oil supply. You're an old fool. You should have thrown them away. Four tracks or four tracks. Colonel! Stop them. Wait. Colonel. He stole up your train for a few hours, but he saved it. He took it through the bombs at the risk of his own life. He's an old man, he doesn't know what he's doing. I'll get your train through. He's just a foolish old man. His train. Yes, it's my train. I know what I'm doing. You, huh? You'll help them. I practically raised you. But you're no better than they are. Swine. <laughs> the Nazi shoot bull on the spot. This to me is the first place where Labiche moves towards. It's not about the art, it's about opposing Nazis. Simply because they are Nazis. Von Waldheim orders Labiche to repair the train. In the morning, Labiche, Pesquot, and Denault prepare to take the engine back to the train. They tell Labiche that they want to stop the train, and Papa Bull would have wanted it that way. They explain that they have a plan, and everyone is on board except Metz, which has to hear from Labiche. Labiche refuses. They are ordered to take the engine out in daytime and are attacked by a single British Spitfire. Labiche speeds the train into a tunnel to save it. He tells his two friends he will call Metz. When the train and the engine are reunited at Reeve Wren, von Waldheim sends Pesquot back and makes Labiche the train engineer. The train is scheduled to leave at 7 p.m., so they take Labiche to a hotel. The hotel is run by widow Christine Jean Marot. A room for this man. I'd like to call, please. Sixty francs. Pay up. You pay up. I'm a guest of the German army. He is a railroad man. Sixty francs. Isn't there a discount for a railroad man? Sixty francs. Labiche has to get out of the room so he can make the call. Pesqua sets a German truck on fire. In the confusion, Labiche goes to the station master's office where he kills a German guard and ties up the station master Jacques, Jacques Marin, so he will seem innocent. Jacques is beaten by the Nazis until he gives a fake ID of the attacker. Finally, the Germans think to check on Labiche. Labiche gets back to the hotel just before the Germans arrive, and he goes into the kitchen. Christine says he has been in the hotel the whole time, but later she gives him the business about risking her life. That night, Labiche and Donant start driving the train towards Germany. Each time they pass a station, German officers in the back of the train cross off the town name on a map. Sergeant Smith, Jean Bouchard, is assigned to ride in the engine. When they get to Metz, apparently bomb damage forces them to turn southward. At each town, fake signs are put up, making the Germans think they are going in the right direction. At the French town of Commissary, the Germans call to inform von Waldheim that they have reached saint avoye the last French town before Germany. In reality, they have been moving west and are almost back at Reeve Wren. Jacques has an engineer come too fast through the yard, and his train derails. As the yard train nears town, another engine pulls in behind it from a sidetrack. The following engine is driven by Pesqua. They shove Smith off the moving train and decouple the engine. They set the engine on full speed and jump. The German guards fire at the escaping French engineers, missing Denon but hitting Labiche in the leg. During a day off from filming, Burt Lancaster hurt his knee while playing golf. They had him shot in the film to explain his limp. The art train engine smashes into the derail train, making a bigger mess. The rolling art cars come in and hit the back of the mess, and then they are hit by Pesqua's train traveling at high speed. There were no models used in this film, so all of the train wrecks are real. In one wreck, three of the five cameras were destroyed. When Pesqua runs away, he is shot by the Germans. Jacques, the station manager, 
and some of the others are executed. Labiche makes it back to Christine's hotel and hides in her cellar. German Major Heron oversees the cleanup of the wrecked trains. That night, Labiche, Dedon, Bennett, and Jacques' nephew, Robert, meet at a farmhouse. Bennett tells them that London wants the roof of the first three cars painted white so they will not be bombed. Robert says he can get the paint and help. In the dark, Robert sets off the air raid signal, and all of the Germans except von Waldheim take shelter. A group of men scramble to the train and begin painting. Von Waldheim sees Robert on the roof and turns the lights on. He shoots Robert. The Don is shot trying to spread the last of the paint. In the morning, workers are scrubbing the paint off when an air raid occurs. In the distance, the Nazis can hear artillery as the Allies draw nearer. When the planes pass over the painted train, von Waldheim realizes the train is protected and can be moved in daylight. It's a signal. They're not going to bomb the train. Don't scrape it up. Leave it there. It's my ticket to Germany. To the east of town, Labiche sets up plastic explosive on the railroad track. As the train nears, he sees that there are French hostages on the engine. He ignites the explosives early, and the train is able to stop without derailing. Von Waldheim wants to have his soldiers search the woods for Labiche. Heron convinces him to just guard the track to keep Labiche away. The wounded Labiche struggles to get ahead of the Germans advancing down the track. He finally does get far enough ahead and removes screws from the track supports. When the train gets going again, Major Herring does not see the missing bolts in time and the train truly derails. Heron tells von Waldheim that it cannot be repaired with the equipment they have. Without a train, impossible. Nothing that's impossible. Get some men to work. I want this engine back on the rails. If we had ten times as many men, it couldn't be done. I tell you it will. Do you hear me? I tell you it will. It's hopeless, Colonel. A German truck convoy comes down the road, and von Waldheim stops it and has the men unload so the art can be put on the trucks. The major in charge of the convoy puts the men back on the trucks and Major Heron tells von Waldheim he has lost. The Germans from the train jump on the trucks, but not before taking the time to murder the hostages. Von Waldheim stays alone by the train. After the convoy is gone, Labiche comes out of hiding and shuts the train down. He then sees the murdered French bodies. When he climbs off the train, he is facing von Waldheim. The Nazi claims such great art will always belong to people who can appreciate it. Here's your prize, Labiche. Some of the greatest paintings in the world. Does it please you, Labiche? You feel a sense of excitement in just being near them? A painting means as much to you as a string of pearls to an ape. You won by sheer luck. You stopped me without knowing what you were doing or why. You are nothing, Labiche. Labiche looks to the dead hostages and shoots him down with a machine gun. This is where I believe Labiche realizes Nazis must be exterminated like the vermin they are. As Labiche walks away, the crates of art are juxtaposed with the bodies of the dead hostages. The film ends. Burt Lancaster only spoke twice in the last 33 minutes of the movie and did not speak once after the 27-minute remaining mark was hit. It was originally planned that Labiche and von Waldheim would have a shootout, but the director decided von Waldheim would commit suicide by taunting. During World War II, the real art train was simply routed to circle around Paris until the Allies arrived. World-famous short summary. Train moves through Indian territory. The free EPUB for subscribers is on the site, so drop by and get your free copy. If you enjoyed this week's show, please tell your friends, and if you really want to help, drop over to iTunes to give me a review. If you want to comment, recommend a movie, or just say hi, follow the links in the show note to my site. Beware the Moors.